As I mentioned last week, I would try to get pictures of our heroes, and I wanted to post this real quick to let you see um, a little bit of what our heroes look like in our sanctuary. And that's Orville, my father, Malin, and Chance, and we would just want to thank you for their service. But you know, you never know uh, what heroes you have in the midst unless you see them, and all of that is, some of them are many years ago, some are not too long ago. But we thank the Lord for their service uh, to their countries. And, uh, but Madeline said that um, Orville didn't have his hat on, but he sure did. He has his hair. My goodness. Uh, if I have hair like that, I'd be jealous. And, uh, but that was at the end of the war. And, and, uh, but he, he doesn't need a hat. He's got his hair. That's good enough. And, uh, but thank the Lord for uh, each and every one of their uh, service uh, to our countries. Let's take our Bibles this morning and let's turn to... The book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 45, Genesis chapter 45. I want us to look at a very important word, forgiveness. It's a word that is or should be utilized daily. And the words, I am so sorry, I am sorry, will you forgive me? is almost a part of a forgotten language. But it's an essential for a relationship with our Lord. It is essential for a relationship with our family, our friends, our community. And this morning, I want us to talk a little bit about forgiveness, learning to forgive and learning to accept an apology. These are things that I'm going to read some things even from a company and a clinic you would might know, Mayo Clinic, talks about the damage of unforgiveness. This is a secular hospital. And they talk about how it is damaging everyone's health that holds on to grudges. And this is important because how many churches are split? How many Christians, how many families are split? How many husband and wives split? Children and fathers and mothers are split over something that could be easily resolved if pride is abolished and humility is broadcasted. And as we look at Genesis 45, I want to look at a man called Joseph. If anybody had the right... The right, which we don't, to hold a grudge, he was the man. He was a man that everybody seemed to do something wrong against him. And he was just a likable fella. But for some reason, he was a lightning rod for ill will. How many of you have ever heard the saying, well, pastor, well, honey, well, this, you don't know what they did to me. That's our excuse for holding a grudge. Well, you just don't understand how bad they hurt me. You just don't understand this. Yeah, I don't. But then again, I could share to you how somebody hurt me and you wouldn't understand either. But is that our crutch? That we're holding on to hindering God from really working. Because the Bible's clear that if we do not forgive someone, he will not forgive us. Because isn't he the portrait of forgiveness? And yet we'll say, but Lord, you don't understand. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't he despised? Wasn't he mocked? Wasn't he rejected by his own people? All for you and I? Oh, I think he understands. How many times have we let him down? And we never asked him sorry. How many times do we put everything else above him? How many times have we given him excuses of why we can't worship? Why we can't read? Why we can't pray? Why we can't witness? And then we'll say, Lord, I'm sorry. But is it you're sorry? Or you're just sorry you didn't do it that time? And this is where I want to learn from a young man 
who showed exemplary character in the face of adversity with his family that did him so wrong. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 1, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with them, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler through all the land of Egypt. Haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God had made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a character such as this that can help us in 2018 learn to forgive. Learn to let go of things that have hurt us, of people that have hurt us, failures that have hurt us. Lord, maybe someone here needs to forgive themselves and to forgive others. And maybe someone here needs to extend the olive branch to someone that has been hurt by them. And Lord, we thank you for relationships with you and reminding us how much better we can be if we're in you. Use this message, I pray, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Learning to say I'm sorry is more difficult for some of us than others. I've learned that the art of the apology is not as straightforward as you would think. On the other side of apology is the forgiver. That can be just as difficult to master. Truly forgiving isn't just uttering a few words and moving on. We often hold on to the events, the past, the words, long into the future for future ammunition. And unfortunately, they drag us down. One of a Christian's most powerful attributes is the ability to forgive and to ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness cannot just be a word. It can be a powerful opportunity for reconnection both with God, the offender, and the healing of ourselves. Learning to forgive can help a person move forward in life rather than becoming a roadblock to life itself. Many also have never learned to forgive themselves for past failures. And they are still years later trying to fix their failures in others instead of themselves. Believing that it will make their pain go away. But failure, forgiveness, anger, grudges, it's just a big ball of emotions that begin to weigh us down. And the longer they're kept under wraps, the heavier they become. Bruce Lee told his son that mistakes are always forgivable if one has the courage to admit them. A wise word from the Kung Fu master. Thomas Manson says, blame keeps your wounds open. Only forgiveness begins the healing process. We can blame everybody else for our problems. But forgiveness begins the healing process. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, please. Matthew chapter 18. 
a classic disciple question. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, Peter comes to the Lord and says this. And only Peter could answer a question like this or ask a question. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. How many times do we wish God had a limitation on us forgiving someone? But isn't it amazing how we evoke the unlimited forgivenesses for ourselves? But Lord, you know I didn't really mean it. You know, Lord, but that person over there is a scoundrel and he deserves the lightning bolt right now. That's how we act. And look what God, son, personally said to Peter. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. But Lord, you don't know what they've done. Doesn't matter. I know what I've done for you. That ought to be the response in our head what has Jesus done for us? Aren't you glad it's not seven times with us? How many of it have evoked that privilege years and years ago? My goodness, I would have been done before I was even four. <laughs> but in Matthew 18, 35, it says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses. I didn't go into detail, but read the curses God puts on a person. He says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone. There's not a limitation, but everyone. This is what the Mayo Clinic wrote about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness leaves wounds with lasting feelings of anger, bitterness, even vengeance. But if you don't practice forgiveness, you might be the one who pays most dearly. By embracing forgiveness, you can also embrace peace, hope, gratitude, and joy. Consider how forgiveness can lead you down in a path of physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means different things to different people. Generally, however, it involves a decision to let go of resentment and thoughts of revenge. The act that hurt or offended you might always be with you, but forgiveness can lessen its grip on you and free you from the control of the person who harms you. Forgiveness can even lead to feelings of understanding, empathy, and compassion for the one that hurts you. Forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you or making up with a person who caused the harm. Forgiveness brings a kind of peace that helps you go on with life. What are the benefits of forgiving someone? Letting go of a grudge and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, stress, hostility, it lowers your blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, an improved heart health, and improved self-esteem is some of the few beneficial health. What are the effects of holding unforgiveness? If you're unforgiving, we have studied that it brings anger and bitterness into every relationship and new experiences. One becomes so wrapped up in the wrong that they cannot enjoy the present. It brings depression and anxiety and anger and even thoughts of suicide. It makes us feel that your life lacks meaning or purpose or that you're at odds with your spiritual beliefs. You lose valuable and enriched connectedness with others until you let go. That is on their website. It's amazing what doctors found out. 
But didn't David says, my bones roar inside me? What was he dealing with? Dealing with the grief of killing Uriah? What did he need to say? God, forgive me for adultery and murder. Until then, he had that burden inside. They said unforgiveness is one of the leading causes for mental health. Really? Wow. He said it also leads to the depression we have today is many people are suffering from not letting go of their problems. And this is probably one of the most world-renowned clinics for many things. Their cancer treatment, their, and this is what their thought on unforgiveness was. C.S. Lewis says, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have to forgive someone. It's a lovely idea, but no, Lord, I'm not forgiving you. C.S. Lewis also said to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Martin Luther King Jr. says forgiveness is not an occasional act. Is it a permanent attitude? This is the sermon topic of the century. In a relationship with others and God, it must be paramount in our thoughts and lives. We do not realize that the Bible is clear about the conditions God puts on forgiving us. Is that we must forgive others before he forgives us. Many people want to ignore that they have unforgiveness in their hearts, yet they tell people that they're right with God. On this one instance, I'll have to agree with Joel Osteen. When you don't forgive, we're not hurting the other person. We're not hurting the company that did us wrong. We're not hurting God. We're only hurting ourselves. Isn't it? We've all been in there. We all have someone that holds a grudge against us. Isn't it interesting that when we said, I'm sorry, and they say, well, no, nope, no. Nope. What you did was too horrible to forgive. Well, what did I do? I, no, not going into it. What, what did I do? No, no, no. You, it's, it's just too, it's too, oh, man. It, it, no, no, I can't tell you what. You just did something horrible. So I'm not going to forgive you. But Christians, when you say, I'm sorry, whatever it was, I'm sorry. You've done all you can do. But you know what God does at that moment? He lifts the burden, that monkey, off your back. Watch that other person. That little ant turn into a triceratops. Next thing is this huge dinosaur in the room. Not an elephant. It's a dinosaur. And my goodness, if you would have dealt with that ant and that person is carrying that dinosaur around on his back, her back, their back, and it is horrible. And they're eaten up with it. How do you know? Number one, I've got family members that treat us that way. So I know. To this day, I have no idea. I'll give one instance because she's no longer my sister-in-law. For 20 years, my brother was married to her. He was not allowed to speak to me very often because I did something horrible to them. Later, it came out that I supposedly pushed her into the limousine and ripped her dress. I was 19 at the time. However, I said I'm sorry, but that was inexcusable. She never forgave me. But what it really was about was the close relationship my brother and I had. She was jealous of it. Video camera was the big one. You remember those big ones? You know. My brother was going through the video, my other brother, and said, I said, oh, stop, 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 stop. They were emerging from the chapel door and the rice was going everywhere and there I was leaning up against the chapel door like this. And my brother walked by and I pulled up in his shirt and I dumped down my rice down his back. 
in the process, he hurried up, and next thing you know, you see both of his hands, and he shoves his wife. And I have never left the chapel door, and the limousine was by Miss Audrey. Even when I showed that to her and said, see, I was nowhere, she would still would not forgive me. Because it was serious to her. It was something she held on for 20 years and she would not let it go. Even when there was video proof that I'd never left the door. But folks, there are church members in this city that when they see me in Walmart, they'll purposely go around to Superstore so they won't have to see me. I still don't know what I've done. I've seen grown people duck behind a counter. And I'm like, oh, there's the pastor. He might see me. I've reached out my hand to shake people and they've gone like this and walked away. And I'm like, how old are you? You know, there's people that I know that I don't like. But I will still make a point to put a smile and shake their hand and say, how do you do? I'm not a coward in that sense. But one time I decided I'd be mischievous. There was a family that left over some doctrinal issues. The Bible's always right in this issue. Anyway, I saw them at Walmart and the husband saw me and started pushing his buggy this way really fast. And so I went around the other aisle and I hit him off. How you doing, brother? Maybe I was mean, maybe I was not. But I wasn't going to let them avoid me because I saw them and I wanted to say hi. And he sheepishly shook my hand and said, is it really that bad? We disagreed. It's been years ago, but it just amazes me how unforgiveness ruins people's lives and it's over something could be, hey, I'm not moving on God's word when it comes to the doctrine of election. Or I'm moving on the doctrine of election. Okay. I have my viewpoint that it's whosoever will. You may have your view on that. But I can still love you as a brother. I can still love you as a sister. We may not be able to agree on this very important doctrine of salvation. However. I can still shake your hand and be cordial. Can we not? We're going to spend it. If you're saved and blood bought. And your name is in the Lamb's book of life. You're going to spend eternity with me. And God may put us next door to each other. So get to like me down here, and I'll get to like you down here. We may agree to disagree, but let's get along. Think about the attitudes that's portrayed when it comes to unforgiveness. Really, a lot of it's very childish. I will not forgive you. Why? Oh, it's horrible. Well, let's get out in the open. You know how you get the pus of a boil out? I hate it when the doctor pulled a scalpel out. But that's the only way you have to lance it to get what's inside out. If not, that boil turns into something worse. Trust me, I had boils for years in Hades. So I know what it's about. There were some that could squeeze and get it all out. There were some that had to lance it. They had to pack it with hot salve. They had to do things in order. They had to give you penicillin, things to get rid of it. But if you let it go, it could have been a detriment to your health. Joseph was a young man that had many things in his life to be bitter about, yet he didn't. He had many things to say, God, you don't understand how this hurt. First of all, he was unjustly abused for being a favorite. That's really not a reason to make someone feel bad. Is it? Hold or grudge someone because someone likes someone a little bit better than the other? But let me flip it this way. Do you have somebody that's a favorite over others? Everyone has a child that they like. It's just one they click with. Everyone has a friend my ex-sister-in-law was jealous over my relationship with my brother. But hey, we had 20 years together where we were like this. 
he was my bully beater. I was the youngest. I was picked on. He was the one that stood up for me. Of course we have a relationship like this. But you know what was interesting? After all was gone on, he picked up the phone. He said, Gordon, I'm sorry we lost all these years. It hurt. But you know, our relationship was never the same. Too many years had gone by. You can't just put it back in the basket even though things are healed between us. You can't put it in the basket and rewrap it. It's out. Think about his brother sold him into slavery because of their jealousy became anger to become wrath. Their jealousy turned to more. How can someone sell their brother? Hate him so much they want him out. They don't even want to see him anymore. See what happens when unforgiveness gets unchecked. Notice what next. He was sold into slavery. Because he was handsome and refused to have sex with the boss's wife. He was accused of rape and put into a dungeon for five plus years. The Bible says he was goodly to look upon. He was a nice looking young man. But because he refused to do the wrong thing, he was accused. Turn with me to Psalms 105. This will give you the gravity of what this man went through. Psalms 105. Look at verse 17. He set a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came and the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all of his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. Did you notice it said his feet hurt? He was shackled with irons for something he didn't do in a dungeon. And then, to make matters worse, when he just about saw the light at the end of the tunnel, he was lied to by a government official. You tell me the dream, and if it comes through, I'll tell the king about you as soon as I get out. Don't believe them. They're government officials. Two years later, the Bible says, and then, oh, by the way, Pharaoh, I, I, I vaguely remember a shabby looking prisoner told me about my dream and it came true. How would you feel? You were wrongly sold. You were wrongly hated. You were wrongly accused. You were lied to. And so for 14 plus years, you were in a place you didn't want to be. Could you not see the hatred, the anger, the resentment festering in a young man very easily? But he didn't. He didn't. I don't understand, but one thing that was God. Only God could have kept his heart from that seed of bitterness. I can't forgive them. That is precisely why God tells you a story of Joseph. Do you really enjoy holding a grudge? Do you really want to forgive in the first place? And we think we have a problem with someone who hurt our little feelings and we justify ourselves acting like children. I've never been in prison, thank the Lord. But even our prisons today are Taj Mahal. <laughs> you get food, three square meals a day. You get cable TV. You get education. You get to become buff. You have everything you want. Heat, air. Oh, man. Do you realize 
33% of Canadians have air conditioning, but 100% of our prisoners do. Think about that thought. Do you realize how many children go with one meal a day or less and all of our prisoners have three square meals? I remember when I was living in Chilliwack, they burnt the prison down in Abbotsford because they didn't get grade A turkeys for Thanksgiving. Literally. We had a gentleman working in our church or serving in our church who was a guard and was stabbed because the turkeys were not grade A. Folks, that was resentment over food. Joseph didn't have much food. Do you realize the main staple of it was watered down soup and a cup of water or a moldy bread? Look at the steady, steady what prisons were like. They were abysmal, dark, dank, disease filled, and yet he remained the light in the prison. So much so that the head of the prison says, hey, I want you to run the prison. You've done such a good job. Now, is the word of God true when it says he was bound in fetters? Can you see him now dragging that ball and chain? And when you drag that chain, it just tears the meat off your ankle. And he's doing it to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Oh, what's the guy crazy? <laughs> Look at Paul and Silas. They were beat. They could have been angry at the Philippians. Said, as soon as we get out of here, we're leaving this sorry town. They don't need the gospel. They were praising the Lord at midnight. And because of it, the Philippian jailer got saved. And then the town turned around and got saved. They could have been resentful. They beat us. All we did was tell them how to have hope. How can God help us overcome injustice done against us? How can he help us forgive others? How can God help us to forgive ourselves and have the courage to ask forgiveness for something we've done? Lack of forgiveness equals bitterness and anger. They caused the first wound, but you are causing the rest. This is what not forgiving does. They got it started, but you kept it going. Forgive and let go or it'll eat you alive. You think they made you feel this way, but when you won't forgive, you're the one inflicting the pain on yourself. Bryant McGill. When you forgive, you heal. When you let go, you grow. An old Chinese proverb. This morning, let's look at a few verses. Questions that we can ask. Can you forgive? Absolutely. The question is, will you forgive? Must I forgive? Yes, always, if you want forgiveness. Must I apologize? Yes, if you want God to honor your sacrifice. Will it be easy? Absolutely not. Because your pride and flesh will say they don't deserve it. Will it help all? Yes, it will. It will strengthen your relationship with God and those around. Have you First, ask God for forgiveness. That's the key. You can go ask everybody else forgiveness, but you first ask God forgiveness for hurting your brother or for not forgiving them. Have you forgiven yourself, second of all, for our sins and failures? Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. As the Lord is giving the model prayer, notice how the Lord highlights what needs to be done. In verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Do you notice how he says, forgive us our debts? Forgive us of our sins? Lead us not into temptation? But he deals two verses entirely with forgiving others. 
It's important. Why? The whole basis of our faith in Jesus Christ is on what? Forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What are we asking forgiveness for? Our sins. 1 John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. If we don't get forgiveness for our sins, what do we have? We might as well close up and let's go skidooing today. What's the purpose of church? One of the things Christians struggle with the most and they will least likely to ask for the help most is forgiveness. Personally, it's very hard for me to ask for forgiveness. And I'm sure it is with you. Because in asking forgiveness means we've done wrong. And our pride says, not our fault, if they hadn't started it, I wouldn't have done it. We, we, we are blame shifters. We love to pass the blame and say, but you don't know what they did. Just say you're sorry and get it over with. But that's hard. Mark chapter 11, 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you got ought, now he's putting the onus on you and I. If we've got a problem with others, go forgive. But also go ask for forgiveness. Look with us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Second Corinthians chapter two. And verse seven through ten. So the contrawise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. Paul is saying very carefully, forgive him. Don't let it it's an interesting chapter to read. But you look at what is going on and you understand that Paul is saying you need to forgive him because his grief is going to be too much. With that thought in mind, turn with me back to Genesis chapter 45. And I want to point out a key aspect Look at verse 5 with me. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. His brothers were wearing the guilt. Grieved means to be burdened down. Joseph saw their guilt. You know why? They were so worried about leaving Benjamin there because dad already lost one son. See how the lie progressed? Dad, he was tore up by a lion. Here's his bloody coat. It was bad, dad. They've had to live with that sorrow knowing they lied to their dad all these years. Joseph, the Bible says, was 30 years old when he came to Pharaoh's court. They had seven prosperous years to do the math. And he said, this is the second year in. He's almost 40 now. He was sold as a teenager. So for 15, 20 years, They've been living with his guilt 
every time that maybe the dad kept the coat. Wouldn't you keep something of someone you loved if they passed? Just a remembrance. And it brings back memories, doesn't it? But see, Jacob was hurt because he lost his son. But just imagine how Jacob felt when he found out what happened. But Joseph didn't hold that. In Genesis chapter 50, notice... In verse 15, a new scenario, five chapters later, Jacob, their father, dies. Uh Uh-oh. Revenge time. Dad's no longer around. He's not going to restrain my brother. And verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will pre-aventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto them. They haven't let it go. They're still worried about their past. When Joseph said, you're forgiven, they were not at the point of really trusting him. Because why would they be worried? They're they're worried that he's going to give them payback. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph. Notice they didn't even go in his presence. These are some interesting things when you read it. Saying, thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brother. Did Joseph have to really have his dad to tell him to forgive him? Was Israel even in the picture in 45? No. He says, is my father alive? They're now lying again, saying, Dad, remember what dad said, Joseph, forgive us. He already forgave you. He already gave them forgiveness. They're still eat up inside. They haven't let go. And you know what this goes to? They haven't forgiven themselves. Joseph forgave them and let it go. They says, oh, thank you, brother, for forgiving us. But they have not forgiven themselves. And notice what it says here. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive their trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I, for I am, or for, excuse me, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but for God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And ye comforted them, and he comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. Notice what he's saying, don't worry about it. It's over. It's in the past. What you meant for bad, God meant for good, so drop it. Forgive yourselves. I'm going to take care of you like I promised. And this is where true happiness comes from the gift of forgiveness. Forgiving others, forgiving yourselves only leads to the spirit of peace and joy. It takes courage to open your heart again after being hurt. But God rewards the ones who are courageous in his name. Have faith and do unto others the way you want others to do unto you. We all have hurt people. We all have committed selfish acts and done things we regret. Don't crucify and hold a grudge toward those who have hurt you. It's not easy, but lean on these words and these verses. And not only on your own understanding. For these verses... And the characters God leaves in the Bible will give you strength to be free from bitterness. Church family and those that are listening and watching, are you going to be a Joseph today and forgive those who have hurt you and forgive yourselves? Are you going to forgive yourself and those that offended you in your life? One of the biggest regrets, bar none, 
at the end of one's life is that they are sorry they never forgave. I looked at a book that I have and it's dealing with parting moments. And the number one regret is holding grudges. How many's heard I should have forgiven my father or my mother? I should have forgiven my brother and they died. I should have forgiven them. How many has heard of as a married couples never to part on a hateful tone because you never know if you're going to get it back? How many times have we yelled at our kids and said, I wish we you were never born? How many times have we yelled at our husband and wife and saying, I wish we were never married? How many times have we looked at each other and said, I hate that church? Or so on and so forth, just out of anger. And we live with that the rest of our lives. Bitterness and unforgiveness is a relationship killer with our God. Unfortunately, people never get it off their mind, even on their deathbeds. Parents, I've had them in my office saying we're the reason our kids are not in church and serving God. We need to ask forgiveness and forgive ourselves and move on. People still have choices. But that doesn't mean we slack up on our obedience to God. Our kids are still watching us. Even after they're grown. My brothers and sisters may not agree with everything my parents say or do. But one thing I could preach a message at his funeral that will come one day if the Lord tarries. And I could say about my father that he has never been unfaithful. He still has the same convictions that I had imposed upon me when I was a teenager and now I'm 46. Times have changed, but my father has not. Agree or disagree, he's still the same. This is something that I can say about my father, but a lot of people can't say that about their parents. But as a parent, that's a hard shoe to live in, to be faithful and consistent. But your kids are watching. If I can come back to the Lord in my 31st year of my life, so could your kids. Don't stop being faithful and don't stop praying. Church members, this was a question I read in one of my devotions this week. Am I the reason why someone's not sitting beside us in church today? That was tough. That means deep soul searching. Those members that used to be here, did I cause them to leave by something I said or did? Are they not in church because of my actions or my unfaithfulness in depicting a Christ follower? Forgiveness is a difficult subject. It's not an easy subject to preach because I battle with the same thing every day. However, it's a right thing to preach. Forgiveness can make us or break us. As my mother, grade school teacher and boarding school in the prison of war told her, the events of this time in a concentration camp could make you better or better. There are people that I heard my mother and the people discussing when I went down to her reunion in Toronto just a few weeks ago saying some people didn't come out of there with a good spirit. And I thought, wow. I look at my mother who's right now in Spartanburg, South Carolina sharing to a large church about her testimony today. She said, pray for me, I'm nervous. I said, when are you ever nervous? 
But what is she doing? Telling the hope and faith that can come from God and God alone. She forgave and moved on. Many of you saw the movie which came after the book called Unbroken. But the book I read years and years ago about a man who was in a prisoner of war, was a pilot in the Doolittle Raid, was kept in a Japanese concentration camp, horribly wronged. Came back home, was in a Billy Graham crusade, got saved, goes back to Japan and hunts down the commandant of that prisoner of war camp that beat him mercilessly every day to tell him Jesus loved him. Tremendous book if you get a chance to read it. And it's called Unbroken. But he goes back and he ends up being a missionary for many, many years to the Japanese people. He loved them because God first loved him. But he had hatred. He wanted to see that man dead until Billy Graham told him about a God that came to save all mankind. Then he wanted to see that guy saved. I won't tell you how the story ends, but I encourage you to read the book. It's a true story of today living in forgiveness. May God help us today. Will we be a Joseph today? Are there things in your life you need to forgive yourself for and move on and let God heal you? Do you need to forgive others? Or do you need to go to someone else and ask forgiveness? If God has spoken to your heart this morning, don't keep it in. Tell God about it. Let Him take that burden before it cripples you. Spiritually, mentally, and physically. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask you that you would help us, Lord. To fight the pride, the bitterness, the self-worth in our lives. To say, Lord, I need your help. I don't want to live like this. God, you have a much better plan in my life for me. than to walk with this bag of bitterness and it's full of grudges and ill will. Help me, Lord. I can't do it myself. But with your help, I can do all things through Christ who strengthen me. Lord, help us to live a life that you have planned for us. In the peace of And the joy that you want to give us. Bring revival in our heart, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen.